And we are now going to do the Gambino Crime Family History Part 7. Uh, part 8 will be likely... Ooh, probably a week and a half away, if not longer. It just depends, but I will update everybody over on Facebook on Mob Talk Radio. If you just type that into your search bar on Facebook, you'll find the page. Give a like, give a follow, give a subscribe, whatever the case may be. So last week, uh, when we left off, Paul Castellano had pushed the Bergen crew a bit too far. Uh, and without many options left on the table, John Gotti puts together his coup. Uh, the hit went off as perfectly as it could, but the FBI, who had had informants at that time, pretty much realized that there was a possibility that John Gotti had pulled off the hit of the century. Uh, while on one hand, they didn't believe that Gotti had the gusto for it or the power, uh, they were hearing many conflicting reports. Uh, but two days after the hit on Paul Castellano, there was John Gotti meeting at the Ravenite Social Club with his captains. And the sheer amount of attention that John Gotti was receiving was a very big indicator that there was a new boss in charge of the Gambino crime family. Gotti had done what most people thought he was not capable of. Uh, there would, however, be an effect and a trickle down uh, from the murder of Paul Castellano. And that's where we pick up today, uh, essentially the aftermath of that. All right, so in the days after Paul Castellano was hit, like we said, uh, John Gotti's name was being circulated uh, all amongst NYPD and all of the organized crime task forces, uh, mainly the C-16 task force. Uh, the government always suspected that Gotti was a part of the Lufthansa heist, and they had been watching him. Uh, so to say that Gotti was not really on their radar is a bit of a misnomer. And just like Paul Castellano, uh, he probably, not he probably, he walks right into the family with problems, right? Uh, and a lot of people, when they talk about the Lufthansa heist, you know, they talk about Henry Hill, Jimmy Burke, but John Gotti was involved in that heist as well, but not in the way that you think he might have been. Uh, his job in the heist, uh, which, like I said, has never really been talked about before, was to make sure that the stolen van that was used by Stax Edwards was crushed in Brooklyn at, at a you know, uh, 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 a fucking uh, a steel yard. Uh, that was Gotti's job was to make sure that he made sure that the van was compacted. But as we know, Stack Edwards uh, never shows up. He ends up falling asleep at his girlfriend's house and the NYPD recovers the van. They run the fingerprints. Uh, and for that failure, he ends up getting killed. Now, John Gotti's role in that uh, and the reason why it was given to him was because he was working at JFK. He was hijacking. He was a hijacker's hijacker. That's the truth about Gotti. Uh, he ends up getting paid $200,000 for his role, and it's pretty much for doing nothing because Stax Edwards doesn't show up. So to say that Gotti wasn't totally on the Fed's radar at that point would have been, be a little bit lopsided. But they never really thought that he was going to be a person of interest. Even with Ruggiero running his mouth, uh, they knew of John Gotti, but I don't think that they realized really the the sort of power or uh, at the or what level that he was uh, actually on. And and even if you listen to all the the Ruggiero tapes, you barely ever hear him mention John Gotti's name, and that was helpful. Uh, even though the feds believed Gotti was getting money from narco the narcotics app or operation, they just never had enough evidence to really use that against him. And per FBI surveillance reports. Uh, just like we said earlier, two days after the Castellano hit, Gotti is seen outside the Ravenite Social Club being greeted by uh, the who's who of the mob and the Gambino crime family. Also, according to FBI reports at the time of Gotti's ascension, uh, the Gambino crime family had 20 captains, which means 20 crews, uh, 250 made men and over a thousand associates. And that's just to show you the sheer size of the Gambino crime family at the time. Uh, the year that Gotti took over, it's been estimated the family was making $100 million a year. And before John Gotti is no longer boss, they were making $400 million a year under his reign. So to say that Gotti wasn't capable of turning a dime as far as getting his guys to bring in money uh, isn't necessarily true. Gotti wasn't known as an earner in his life, uh, but that's not the case when he was boss. Uh, the downside to Castellano's murder was that the, the sheer press that the mafia was beginning to get. Uh, the mob was on notice uh, as far as the press goes as hundreds of articles began to show up around the country discussing the mafia. Prior to that, you barely ever saw them. 
but this hit created such a fucking atmosphere and such a fucking circus uh, that now dozens of articles are coming out every month about the mafia, and it sort of puts the mob on Front Street like never before, and Gotti gets blamed for that. Uh, with Castellano dead, uh, you know, Castellano's cases against him would go on and everybody would end up getting convicted. The commission case would then come next and everybody gets convicted in that too. Then right after that, the Pizza Connection case comes and everybody gets nailed in that too. So it was like three major shit storms all happen relatively uh, at the same time or a couple of years apart. Uh, there is some who argue that, that the Castellano hit uh, inflamed the police and the FBI so much uh, just because the mere fact that it was so brazen, so public, and a lot of people could have gotten hurt, that the FBI ended up getting chastised by upper officials in Washington, D.C., especially uh, when you look, uh, you know, when you look at things like is, we talked about the Ruggiero and Jerry Langella tape. And, and on that tape, and we mentioned it last week, is that they're really they're talking openly about if Paul gets hit, he gets killed, who really gives a fuck? Uh, and you have Langella, you know, talking about his greed. And then you have the Corallo tapes of Corallo saying he's a greedy prick. Whatever happens, happens. The FBI knew that. And I think the FBI had a duty to inform Castellano that, listen, people are talking about killing you. And they never did that. And so when you combine that with the brazen hit, uh, Washington is, you know, up in arms over the FBI. Uh, what the fuck are you doing kind of a deal? Uh, and what ends up happening as a result of that is the FBI is given a direct order to get Gotti uh, in the mob at any cost. And therefore, tons of money uh, would begin to trickle down into organized crime task forces in New York City. Uh, and that's the sheer amount of money that the, the government dumped into going after Gotti has never been seen before or since Al Capone. Uh, the original indictment that we talked about last week with Della Croce and company would now include John Gotti. Uh, it would be a racketeering charge, which was added after Castellano was murdered. And this indictment was separated from the Ruggiero and Gene Gotti narcotics case. The problem for Gotti is, uh, just as he becomes boss, if he gets convicted on this racketeering charge, he's going to look at 20 years to life. And that's going to end his reign almost immediately. Uh, there was another case that was being filed uh, as you know, Gotti allegedly, according to the FBI and NYPD, had beat the shit out of a delivery driver by the name of Ronald Pyek, uh, excuse me, Pisek. Uh, obviously, if you've seen the first Gotti film, you know what I'm talking about. It was a beef over a parking space. Gotti tuned him up. Uh, and so as 1986 came rolling around, Gotti was awaiting two trials. Uh, he was holding court daily at the Ravenite. The problem for Gotti uh would have the the particular problem that he would have at the time was spillover from the castellano hit uh some in the family you know took this as a sign to settle old beefs amongst each other so if Gotti was the, and i don't want to say reckless but if Gotti whacked paul castellano it sort of kind of gave the green light for everybody else in the family to kill anybody they had a fucking problem with uh, because the, the Gambino family in the 1980s was a murderous fucking bunch of people. I'm just telling you the truth. Um, and there was an old beef that needed to be taken care of. Uh, you know, if the, I guess the old saying is, if the leader whacks with impunity, why can't they? Uh, Frankie DeChico was officially the new underboss of the Gambino crime family, and he had an ongoing beef with a guy by the name of Gus Scalfani. Uh, Scalfani was a low-level associate who had an ear with Paul Castellano. Uh, it also helped that Scalfani's mother-in-law, Mildred Russo, worked as a court clerk uh, in the Daniel Patrick Monahan United States Courthouse for the United States District Court of the Southern District of New York. Therefore, uh, Scalfani could report leaks to Castellano about indictments, about investigation, and Scalfani felt that it would elevate his sort of person, I don't want to say personality, but it would elevate him uh, in, the, in the Gambino crime family. Uh, so what ends up happening, uh, is Frankie DeChico never liked them. He thought he was a brown noser, uh, and Scalfani knew it. Uh, Scalfani was a bitter sort of kind of guy and he wanted to rise within the family. And so what he would do is he would tell Paul Castellano, listen, I'm giving you this information about court cases, but I'm telling you that Frankie DeChico is a fucking rat. 
Castellano ends up looking into the matter and he ends up calling uh, DeChico on the carpet for the allegations. Listen, guys are saying you're a rat. What the fuck is this all about? Ultimately, at the end of the end of the day, Castellano wouldn't believe that there was any truth to the allegation and the issue was let go. However, Frankie DeChico never forgot it. Uh, DeChico then would ask John Gotti for permission to kill Scalfani and Gotti gave him permission to do it. Uh, Gotti would suggest farming the hit out to Joe Watts. Uh, who was the go-to guy for any sort of hit that needed to be done. And what ends up happening is Scalfani is told to come to a meeting in the basement of the Ravenite. Uh, I don't know what the circumstance as to what he was told. However, he ends up showing up. He heads downstairs, goes into the basement, and as he enters, Joe Watts shoots him in the leg twice. Scalfani falls, and then Watts pulls out a butcher knife and finishes the job. Uh, His body was dismembered and then dumped, and it was never, ever found. Uh, As Gotti begins to run the family, he does realize that one of the mistakes that Castellano made was not showing face, not being around the street guys, and Gotti was not not about to go in hiding for anybody, uh, which ultimately would be his undoing in the end, but I understand the concept of not wanting to make the mistakes your predecessors made. Uh, Sometimes being seen or sometimes being heard is being better than being seen, and every week uh, the captains would have to meet with John Gotti, which was a huge mistake on his behalf. Uh, one of the things that Gotti wanted to do was mend fences. Uh, he felt like showing up at other captain's clubs was a way to do that, and he wanted to meet with Jimmy Brown, Falia. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because Jimmy Brown didn't like what happened to Castellano, but he just accepted it and said, okay, you know, John's the boss. And so there was a plan for John Gotti to head down to the Veteran and Friends Social Club off 86th Street in Bensonhurst. Uh, and one of it, one of the things was for him to just show face, make him not make amends, but just show face and just sort of level everything out. Um, and, you know, Jimmy was a highly respected guy. He brought in a ton of money from his garbage hole and rackets. And, and I think for Gotti, he just wanted to sit down, small chat, smooth the water a bit. Uh, and so one of the things Gotti was going to do was he was going to meet at the club. Uh, and the idea was that Frankie DeChico would meet him there and then he would take John Gotti to another meeting, which Gotti needed to have earlier that day, the later on that day. But at the last second, for whatever reason, and nobody knows, John Gotti ends up changing his plans and he, uh, you know, he, he pretty much calls and tells Frankie, listen, uh, uh, change the fucking plans. And so Frankie DeChico, who was at the veterans friends, uh, and social club awaiting John Gotti, as was Sammy Gravano. Uh, you know, just decides, all right, well, let me, let me go back. Let me go pick up John and take him wherever he needs to go now. So he and Frankie Bellino decide to leave and they're going to head towards Manhattan, uh, to go, you know, uh, grab Gotti and, and do whatever they got to do. And as they leave the club, they begin to head towards Frankie's car, which was parked outside right up against the curb. And as Frankie touches the door handle, the car fucking explodes. Uh, Frankie was, you know, killed instantly. And Bellino was lucky enough to escape with his life. Uh, sheer happenstance was that Sammy Gravano was sitting inside of the social club at the same time. Uh, Gotti is eventually told what happens, and he calls a meeting at Tally's, which was Gravano's club. Uh, not long after the car bombing, the NYPD uh, pretty much shows up uh, and starts to do sort of their criminal uh, in- investigation. And the consensus... Uh, that that the cops and this will show you just some shrewd shit that was going on is the cops believed that this was just retaliation uh, for Frankie DeChico stabbing Paul Castellano in the back and going along with Gotti and killing Castellano. Uh, the feds really believed that it that that it was probably a rival family that did it. Uh, so a lot of people were saying the Genovese crime family, or maybe it was even a rival faction within the Gambino crime family. They didn't like it, and and they really didn't know for sure. Uh, And this is where the debate is really going to begin because the story, or at least the setting in which we're about to talk about, uh, has been reported throughout the years. And and there are a few sides to it, and we're going to kind of explore each side. Uh, And there were two main sort of competing stories. The first one is that Vinny Gigante was hell-bent on revenge, and this was his way of sort of fixing the situation. Uh, And the second one was that uh, Gaspipe Casso did it as revenge for the Gotti regime for the attempted hit on himself by Jimmy Heidel, which was ordered by Angelo Ruggiero over a drug turf beef. Those are the two narratives. That's what's been spoken throughout the years. But let's get through to the first narrative. Uh, So here's what has been said. 
uh, Tony Ducks Corallo, who had, like I said, been caught on wiretaps, basically talking shit about Paul Castellano, uh, allegedly uh, met, and this is according to Gas Pipe Castle, allegedly met with Vinny the Chingigante shortly after Castellano was murdered, and he agrees Gotti has to be killed for his actions. It was sort of a let's plan his murder meeting. Uh, according to informants, Danny Marino, who was a captain in the Gambino crime family, had been approached by Tony Ducks and Vinny Gigante to whack John Gotti. Uh, and then they would make Jimmy Brown Falia the new boss of the Gambino crime family. So the hit was actually, according to informants, again, uh, farmed out to Genovese soldiers in New Jersey, but they couldn't form they couldn't really form a, a valued plan for his execution. Uh, allegedly then Vinny Gigante then farmed it out to Herbie Pate, who was a former cop. Uh, and as a side hustle was an explosive e expert. According to what's been said, Pate took the job and would use C4 to get the job done. It was Pate who allegedly slipped the device under Chico's car. Uh, and, and like I said, most of this information was provided by Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Uh, Gaspipe, Gaspipe has acknowledged over the years that he was involved in the plot to kill John Gotti. In any event, Casso and Pate, according to Casso, went to the 19th Hole Club, which was right down the street from the Veterans and Friends. Uh, and as they see DeChico coming outside, they hit the button, boom, and the rest is fucking history. While that theory uh, can be accurate in some ways, there's something else. First of all, you have to understand Vincent Gigante, okay? He is not nor would meet with anybody. He was notorious for not meeting with anybody but his captains. I find it hard to believe that he's going to get it, catch himself or put himself in a situation to have a conversation with another boss about killing another boss. I just don't think it was ever going to fucking happen. Uh, n secondary to that, Vinny Gigante would never have a fucking conversation with a cop. Whether or not he was a dirty cop, a retired cop, Vinny Gigante never would have had a fucking conversation with a cop. Gigante was just not that fucking guy. Uh, he might have passed word, uh, but from everything that I've ever heard about Vinny, uh, yeah, it's true. He did, not, he did not like John Gotti. He didn't like what he stood for, uh, but he had nothing to do with how, what happened to Frankie DeChico. In fact, if you look even closer uh, to the... Uh, ex-police officer Pate uh, that didn't come from Vinny Gigante it came from Stephen Caracapa and Louis Eppolito uh, Gigante never would have had any sort of interaction with a guy doing a hit let alone a cop I mean it would just be uh, you have to look at the way that Vinny Gigante led his life I mean a guy walked down the street in a fucking piss stained bathrobe for Christ's sakes you think he's going to sit down with a cop a dirty cop no absolutely fucking not and i have a good theory about this and i think it's right but um you know this move this entire murder of frankie de chico and i don't give a fuck what gravano says he's wrong this it, it, because i have a theory on gravano too i have a theory that gravano knew that fucking frankie de chico was going to get hit and if you think about it and this is going to open up a lot of fucking debate and discussion uh who stood the most to gain from frankie de chico getting killed Gigante doesn't get anything out of that. And you can't, when you look at Frankie DeChico and, the, and, and Bellino who were hitting that car bomb, neither one of them looks like John Gotti. So you mean to tell me as well known as John Gotti was, as open as John Gotti was, as well seen as John Gotti was, they make a mistaken identity and blow up the, the wrong two fucking people? Bullshit. If any of the chin Gigante wanted John Gotti dead, he would have been fucking dead dead like immediately fucking dead he wouldn't have needed gas pipe casso to do it he wouldn't have needed an ex-cop to do it he would have sent a team of shooters and that would have been the end john Gotti was not hiding from fucking anybody he was out and about so then why risk using a car bomb and killing a bunch of other people that to me smells of retro fucking for something else and that's the fucking truth so who had the most to gain who became underboss after frankie de chico was killed I'm just saying, I'm not saying Gravano had anything to do with it, but I just think it's awful fucking suspect to me. Uh, Gravano was a snake in the fucking grass. He's the one that stood the most to gain. I'm not saying that he was complicit, but he might have known something too, because you got to remember, let's go back. He had some conversations with Gaspipe, did he not? Did Gaspipe not tell him, at least according to what's been recorded? 
that once you guys do this, because remember, it was Gaspipe and Gravano who met with Casso. Casso told them, everybody that's involved in this is going to be killed within a fucking year. You do realize that. So, listen, I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no. I just think it's fucking highly suspect. But let's continue. Uh, so, let's take Gigante out of the fucking, the whole mix. Out of the whole mix. For, second of all, John Gotti was so fucking hot. And on the wire, and what I mean on the wire, meaning people talking about him, informants giving him up. You think Vincent Chinjigante, who's playing the fucking nut role, is going to risk any of that to get involved? Do you think he wanted any part of that nonsense? No. You get Cotty down the line, and he's not going to use a bomb to fucking do it. He's going to send a hit squad. He had them, in his, he, they were readily, readily available. So I don't buy anything that gas pipe Casso says he's lying. I think Gravano is lying. I, and, and, and I have a theory as to why, and that's what we're going to get into now. Uh, this was a move directed by gas pipe Casso out of anger because him and Angelo Ruggiero were having a beef over drugs. Angelo tries to have gas pipe Casso killed. Casso used that. And we all know because he hired Jimmy Heidel, who was the nephew of Danny Marino. Heidel tries to kill him, fucks the job up. Next thing you know, Gas Pipe uses Epolito and Caracapa to kidnap Heidel. He tortures him, gets the name Angelo Rogerio, then kills him. So Gas Pipe has every fucking reason in the world to want retribution, and he's going to use it to his advantage. So just keep following this line with me, and you'll understand. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, Gas Pipe knows a couple of things. He knows immediately that the police are going to suspect either somebody in, inside the crime family or they're going to uh, suspect somebody outside of the crime family. The FBI knew at the time that the, the most powerful mob family next to the Gambinos is Vincent the Chin Gigante. They knew, just because of the Concrete Club and everything else, that him and Vinny Gigante were very, very close. So naturally, who do you think the FBI is going to suspect? Well, they're going to suspect that Vinny Gigante pulled the strings, which immediately pulls gas pipe off the fucking suspect list. Uh, not to mention, the Gambino crime family would likely suspect that it came from Vincent de Chingigante and the Genovese crime family and not Gaspipe Casso. Uh, and, and so, from my perspective, uh, it, it, listen, it's a solid plan from Gaspipe, to be honest with you. Uh, Casso needed to do it. He needed to get revenge. And he needed to lay off any suspicion that he had anything to do with it. And that's exactly what he did. And if you look at the relationship that Gaspipe had with Stephen Caracapa and Louis Eppolito, they also knew Pate. There's your connection. That's how they get to Pate through Epolito and Caracapa. Uh, so, uh, like we said, th there was a beef between Ruggiero and Casso. Uh, Casso, you know, we know was moving in on his drug turf, uh, and we know how that we know how that sort of goes. Uh, it, so it's my, you know, uh, you know, I I think the gas pipe. You know, and a lot of people are going to say, well, why didn't Gas Pipe just fucking kill Angelo? Well, if you've been listening to this show for any length of time, you know that that was almost an impossibility. Uh, because the day that Sal Ruggiero dies in a plane crash, the FBI is all over Ruggiero from day one. They're bugging every place he lives. They're bugging every place he goes. They're following him every place he goes. There was no way that Gas Pipe could get away with it. Just absolutely no fucking way and so maybe the best way of doing it is sort of an eye for a fucking eye uh because i think that gas pipe felt that the pow most powerful of the bunch he could hit was frankie de chico and he would have been right uh so uh y you know uh, i i i think that if you just think about it in terms of that that makes the most sense it 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 propels the blame onto other people and he's got himself a good M.O. I told Frankie this was going to happen. I told you, you and Sammy and Angela, I told all you guys this would happen. You didn't listen to me. And now look what's going on. I'm telling you before, I don't think Vic Amuso is going to deal with this. He, you're going to have to suffer his ire. He's setting them up. He's setting them up the whole way. And then once Rogerio moves on him, that's it. All bets are off. So just prior to the bombing. Uh, John Gotti had gone to court over the Pisic beating. The, the problem uh, is that the press was busy reporting that the you know Gambino boss was was caught in a traffic beef? It was all over the press, uh, which is another reason why 
I think a lot of mob guys started having problems with with Gotti. But uh, so the case is coming to court, and Pisek ends up seeing the papers because the papers are reporting that John Gotti's in a beef with this guy, threw him a beating, and immediately the victim in this case starts to see, oh, fuck, this is the boss of the Gambino crime family. Like, I got, I can't do this. And so what ends up happening is he comes to court and all of a sudden he's blind, deaf, and dumb, doesn't know anything. And the Joyce, uh, excuse me, the judge has no choice but to throw the fucking case out. The next day, this is literally what the headlines were on the New York Post. I forgot he. And that presents a problem because now it, it, it and it's not John Gotti's fault. He beat the case. Okay. But now the feds are pissed because the little thing they thought they could get him on is now gone. And so uh, the next up for John Gotti was the indictment, which was technically the United States of America versus Neil Della Croce and John Gotti. Uh, the prosecutor in that case was Diane Jacqueline, who would be the first prosecutor. Uh, well, it, not the first, but she would be the one cunt. And I'm going to say that because of what she did to Willie Boy Johnson. Uh, but she had refused to work with the FBI on any level. Uh, if she had, then she would have probably had a much better case, especially when it came to the tapes and surveillance that the FBI had. But there's always been a history of the Queen's DA and the FBI not sort of getting along, not talking, not communicating, not sharing information, because everybody wants fucking headlines and everybody wants conviction rates. Uh, Jack Lone had requested that John Gotti's bail be denied in that case and that he be held throughout the entire trial in jail as she feared reprisals for the DiCicco killing. So right here, you know, she believes that because Frankie was killed that all of a sudden the Gambinos are going to strike back and she feels like if Gotti's on the streets that he's going to be the one in charge of that. Uh, the judge overseeing the case would hold hearings to decide what they were going to do with John Gotti. Uh, which was the revocation hearings. Uh, Bruce Cutler would argue on Gotti's behalf for nearly a week, but ultimately the judge would agree with Diane Jack alone that Gotti's bail uh, should be revoked, and that's the way it went down, and Gotti would be given the weekend at home to just prepare for going to jail, and that's exactly what John did, and then he would surrender the following morning. In his absence, uh, he left Sammy Gravano, who we know eventually down the line would be elevated to underboss, but he wasn't at this point. Uh, would Gravano, uh, Angelo Ruggiero, and Joe Piney Armone would be sort of the panel. Uh, why Gotti on earth put Angelo in that position considering everything he was about to go through and currently ongoing and everything he had done uh, doesn't make sense to me, but it does in a sense of, I think that if, you know, and, and here's what I'm saying. If he elevates Ruggiero, and now gives him power, then there's less sort of problems within the Gambino crime family because Angela brought a lot of heat on them, but now he's in the upper tier of running things. So that's going to smooth that over. And I get why he did it. Uh, on the back end of all of this, uh, you know, if we look at uh, Diane Jacqueline's history, she really didn't have any experience going after the mafia. Uh, she knew that she had Willie Boy Johnson, who was an informant, and she could expose him as such, forcing him to testify. Uh, and, and that's sort of really some underhanded shit because she essentially uh, is going to seal his death sentence. Uh, she knew that he was informing the Queen's DA. She knew that he was informing to the FBI, and she had wanted him to testify and tried to force him to do so. Uh and he refused to do it. And so what she ends up doing is she back channels the FBI and she goes to the judge uh, or she goes to, excuse me, she back channels the FBI, which means she didn't talk to them. And she ends up going to the judge uh, and saying that, you know, she's going to force him to testify in the FBI on their behalf steps, steps up and explains to the judge, you know, you cannot out this guy because if you allow her to use him, uh, as as a, uh, someone to testify in this case, not only is he going to be fucking killed, but any case information that he's giving us to build a federal case is going to be pretty much flushed down the fucking shitter. Uh, and so there was sort of an argument about it, but at the end of the day, Jack alone was a real fucking cunt uh, because there's no other way to really describe this, this broad. Uh, she didn't care about Willie Boy Johnson. She didn't give a fuck about him. Uh, but her, all she wanted was conviction rate. It was the Jack alone show. Uh, and what she does is she orders Johnson to testify and he refuses. And her response to him is to fucking out him publicly at a hearing. 
uh, you'd be hard pressed. You're not going to find another uh, prosecutor that's ever fucking done that. She just outs him uh, in front of everybody, in front of Gotti, in front of everybody. She outs him as a fucking rat. Uh, and because she does that, she ruins the FBI case that the FBI was going to use for Johnson. Uh, and then to, to just trump it, uh, at that point, whatever Willie Boy Johnson was going to say, forget it. He's clamming up. He's not saying another fucking word. Go ahead and prosecute me. I'll go to jail the rest of my life. I don't care. So because she didn't get what she wanted with Willie Boy Johnson, now she outs Billy Batista who was another informant that nobody knew about. So rather than protect either one of those guys, she outs them both. But lucky for Batista, somebody tipped him off in the prosecuting office. Somebody made a call and said, look, she's fucking just outed you. Get the fuck out. Uh, And that's what he does. He gets on a plane and nobody's ever seen him again. So uh, as Gotti is still sitting in jail, waiting this case, he orders the death of Robert DiBernardo. Uh, DiBernardo was a money machine for the Gambinos, and Gotti orders his death on the words of Salvatore Gravano. According to Gravano, he said that the order of DiBernardo's death was shocking, and he couldn't believe that Gotti would order it. But the fact is, uh, you know, we look a, a year or two forward, uh, Gotti, like we talked earlier, is caught on a wiretap, essentially saying that Gravano sent word that the DB was talking about Gotti behind his back, talking subversive, uh, and, and giving, given the shaky ground post the Castellano hit, it was probably going to be a better idea to kill the motherfucker. Uh, and Gotti takes Gravano with his word and orders his death. What, what is interesting about that is the Gravano then absorbed all of his rackets, all the porn shit Gravano took over. Imagine that. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time, and it wouldn't be the last time that Gravano lied to Gotti to get something that he wanted. Uh, DiBernardo was summoned to Gravano's office on Stillwell Avenue, and as he's drinking coffee, he's shot in the back of the head twice by Joe Peruta, and his body was never found. Uh, Once again, this is a a Gravano move to take over rackets. Uh, So Gotti's still sitting in jail awaiting trial, uh, and Angelo Ruggiero ends up getting himself in real deep shit. Uh, And in June of 1986, he ends up getting pinched again and another racketeering indictment. So he's got, what, three indictments coming on him now. Uh, Not John Gotti, but Angelo Ruggiero. Uh, The government would move to revoke his bail, uh, and Ruggiero, rather than just dealing with the the revocation of bail, goes absolutely apeshit and starts threatening everybody and their fucking mother in the courtroom. Threatens the prosecutor, the judge, and whoever else. And he ends up in jail, which absolutely infuriates John Gotti. Uh, Prior to that, you know, like I said, Gotti had been considering Ruggiero for the underboss position. Uh, but after doing this, that was it. That that would really render Ruggiero's life and the mob is done. Uh, it was just too much for Gotti. Uh, and what Gotti does in response is to name Joe Armone his official under underboss. However, you know, Armone was kind of an old guy. And, and Gotti, you know, he wanted Armone to still feel valuable. He didn't want to, like, step over him. And so he gives the title to Armon, but secretly the position really is kind of given to Sammy Gravano uh, to just sort of run the day-to-day operations, which was probably Gotti's biggest fucking mistake ever. Uh, So Gotti's first trial would get going at the end of 86. Uh, The courtroom was packed with reporters and gawkers alike. Rather than go through the entire trial, uh, we're going to hit some points. And one of the things that I am going to do when we come back off a break is we're, we're going to jump. We're going to jump right back into this trial because there are some major points we got to hit. But I wanted to kind of just give you sort of a brief outline to think about uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, so uh, Diane Jack alone would bring up Gotti's past allegations of murder and mayhem and brought up the murder of Jimmy McBratney, who Gotti didn't even shoot. Uh, it was actually Ralph Gallione that did that. Uh, Jack alone would then, you know, sort of do a mafia tutorial for the jury. Bruce Cutler would present Gotti as a hardworking guy who came from a dirt poor family at 12 uh, and had managed to live a good life despite awful odds. And he had made something of himself. So kind of the compare and contrast. One says he's a gangster. The other says he's a good human being Uh, on the government's end. And they had Sal Polisi, uh, who was a piece of shit mob wannabe uh, who had become a government informant. Uh, Polisi was so fucking bad, uh, as a witness, uh, that, uh, you know, a, a large part of his testimony, 
uh, was definitely made up. And the reason why I say that is because there was there was an interview that he gave to a book author about his life, which was completely different than that of his testimony. Uh, and, and that was probably uh, you know enough for the government to at least uh, showcase uh, uh, the first informant, and he was the first informant. And so it was enough for the government. But once again, we see historically that everything that he testifies to is totally refuted by what he told the fucking author. So which one is he lying to, the jury or the fucking author? Take your fucking pick. Um, Jack Alone's case, you know, against Scotty wasn't really that strong, but the Gambino crime family wasn't going to lay odds here. Uh, they needed a non-conviction or a mistrial, and, you know... Uh, they have. They were going to do anything that they could to ensure that John Gotti walked from this case. Uh, Kevin McMahon, uh, who was adopted by the Carniglias, uh, who was at the trial watching, noticed that one of the jurors outside the court building uh, had gotten into a car. And for whatever the reason, he, he decided to copy down the license plate and he hands it over to John Carniglia. Uh, McMahon then would start doing that with other jur jurors' cars and plates as well, and he would hand them over. Next thing you know, the Gambino crime family would station guys around the courthouse parking areas to copy down license plates. They would even follow them home. They'd get their addresses and in some cases would use that information uh, to a source within the DMV to give them the names and addresses of those jurors. One of these jurors was a guy by the name of George Pop, Pope, excuse me, uh, who actually, by coincidence, was friends with uh, an associate of the Gambino crime family by the name of Bosco Radanovich. Uh, so, uh, what ends up happening is Poppy had told Radonovich, uh, who actually was very close friends with John Gotti, uh, that for the right place, or for, excuse me, for the right price, he would hold out. He would guarantee there would be a mistrial at the very minimum. Uh, he ends up telling Bosco that he wants $120,000. Uh, and Sammy Grove, the bull Gravano was used to send, to go to him to negotiate a smaller price because they thought 120000 was a fucking joke. Gravano was able to negotiate that down to $60,000. The payment gets dropped over to Bosco, who gets it to Pate. Uh, at worst case, we're going to head to a mistrial. Uh, and the thing is, is that Gotti probably didn't need to do that because Diane Jackalone's case was very, very soft. Uh, but, you know, the Gambinos at the time weren't willing to play those odds. And so basically they, they bribed a, a, a juror. Uh, what also helped Gotti, uh, what also was going to help him in this trial, if you negate and take the money off the table, is that she was inept. Uh, she would rely on junkies for witnesses. She would rely on people who couldn't corroborate anything. Uh, and there was a witness by the name of Matthew Trainer who had been a junkie, a bank robber, a heroin dealer. Uh, and he was going to be a witness prior to this sort of trial uh, against John Gotti. Jack alone pretty much treated him like a piece of shit uh, and ends up going to Cutler. And he tells Bruce Cutler, I'm switching sides because, you know, that Jack alone, she wants me to lie. She wants me to stress the truth. She wants me to connect John Gotti to things that I know he wasn't involved in. And specifically in early meetings between Jack alone and Trainer, uh, she was very specific and wanted a trainer to say that John Gotti was into doing drugs and selling drugs, specifically oxys and Valium. Now, Valium's not really a fucking drug, um, but she wanted him to, in fact, make that shit up. Now, if you know John Gotti or anything about him, he was never a drug guy. Uh, he never did drugs. So, uh, and this is before prescription drugs became like a thing. If you really think that John Gotti was involved in that, I got a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn, too. Uh, then Trainer goes on to tell Bruce Cutler that he and Jack Lone, you know, had gotten into a beef and he made some comments to her about, oh, you're just sexually repressed and that you need to get laid. You've got problems, uh, basically because she was off her rocker uh, in those meetings. And then she allegedly, according to Trainer, pulled out a pair of her underwear and told him to go jerk off at him. So <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got a bit of everything in this case. Um those accusations combined with Jack Lone's behavior and her antics uh, and borderline strange accusations didn't make her look very good, which is why they, the prosecution office never used her again in anything. Now, when you take all of those things into consideration, did Gotti really need to get a juror? I don't think so. I think he could have beat that case. In March 6th of 1987, the jury was handed the duty to convict or to acquit. 
Six months of trial and a few million dollars had been spent on this. And the early signs were that Jacqueline wasn't uh, was absolutely horrendous for the government. The government didn't feel like she presented a good case. They they thought they wouldn't win. Uh, in the back rooms of the courthouse, a lot of federal agents were just absolutely pissed off with her, uh, just by the way she acted, by outing informants, and her unwillingness to even work with them. Uh, on March 13th of 1987, the jury reached its verdict. All defendants, including John Gotti, John Carneglia, Jeannie Gotti, Lenny DeMaria, jo- Jojo Carrazzo, Anthony Rampino, and Willie Boy Johnson were all pronounced not guilty. Gotti would walk out of that courtroom and head back to Howard Beach, the victor. Uh, and that is going to be what we're going to talk, where we're going to end today, because I want to go back. Uh, to that court case specifically and get real detailed because there were some real details because what I want to show you guys and girls is that the corruption of the agents, the corruption of the office, uh, of the DA, because there were things that were said and things that were done that you're not going to fucking believe. And I have all those court transcripts and what I'm going to do while I'm on vacation is go through a lot of these transcripts and just highlight different features that I want to talk about. The, the, the following trial after that was even more ludicrous. Uh, and it's not to say that John Gotti was a saint, but I am a big proponent of showing where the Justice Department is not really honest about shit. Uh, if you look at this case, listen, uh, as we know, Willie Boy Johnson is going to get killed. And we're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. Uh, but the important thing is, is that what prosecutor hell-bent on just getting herself accolades out to fucking informant? How did she think that that was going to end? And listen, I'm not saying that, that rats deserve to, to ride off into the sunset. But what she did to Willie Boy Johnson was fucked up because for 15 years he was informing and she pretty much just announces it. No matter what happens. Now, if he even doesn't testify, which Willie Boy Johnson at that point didn't. And they weren't able to use anything. Uh, so in essence, you know, they took all this information from him. She fucked the FBI. She fucked everybody involved. And she got him killed. Because everything that he had given them is now in the wash. Because now he's not going to say nothing. And he ends up telling John, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm sorry this happened. I won't say nothing. And according to a lot of people, God, he says, well, all right, fine. But you're out of the mob. You're done with me. I'm never going to speak to you again. But I won't kill you. Anybody that believes that that conversation ever took place is bullshit. I don't think Gotti ever had that conversation with him. I think Willie Boy Johnson knew what the fuck time it was. Uh, I know that the FBI would uh, approach Willie Boy Johnson and and offer to throw him in Witsack so that he wouldn't get killed, and he he, he refused. But at that point, what the fuck, what does it matter? Because anybody you've ever been close to now knows you're a rat, you know you're going to get killed, you might as well just fucking cash your chips in. Uh, And I think that one of the most repulsive things uh, that the government has ever done is do what they did to Willie Boy Johnson. I'm not saying he didn't deserve to get killed for what he did, but it should not be at the hands of the FBI outing him or uh, the Queens DA. You really can't blame the FBI on that one. It, It was the Queens DA. And I hope that that broad Jack alone has jungle rot, jungle crotch rot at this point. Fuck, God. Because you just don't do that. Uh, you know, Willie Boy Johnson got what was coming to him in many ways, and I get it, and I understand it, but it should never come as the result of uh, some fucking pencil-pushing fucking cunt. And that's the truth. I, I don't think that's right, and I, I'd be willing to bet you John Gotti didn't even think that was right. And so... As we take our vacation, which I'm looking forward to, uh, we will be back with part eight of the Gambino crime family probably in a week and a half, 10 days. Uh, And so in the meantime, I wish everybody well.